Hey kids, Mark Bradshaw of DrBeard.com here, and welcome to my personal top 10 list of video games released in the year of 2013. 2013 wasn't just a great year for gaming, but a great year for the gaming community. We matured quite a bit, with greater societal issues that the community was ignorant of finally coming to the fore. Sure, we have a lot of work left to do, but a community stereotyped by basement dwelling hermits and dude bro frat boys is suddenly aware of issues ranging from misogyny, homophobia, transphobia, and even clinical depression. Sure, the usual suspects reacted poorly to this. We were introduced to the term diversity corner. We were introduced to people who would call up a developer suffering from crippling social anxiety and harass her in vile and disgusting ways. We were introduced to a community of men who would attempt to destroy a woman's livelihood for the simple sin of saying she was tired of seeing women treated as trophies. I refuse to believe these cretins are the majority and now we know the size of the work that's set before us. But if the community was depressing, at least the games were great. This is easily the best year of the console generation, and one of the greatest gaming years we've ever seen. I'm excited to bring you all this list, and excited to see my fellow Nacho Bird contributors list as well. There are legitimately 5 or 6 games that would have no problem placing atop my list this year, and I struggled mightily with the top 3. In the end, I could not even bring myself to winnow this list down to 10 games. So here's my top 10 games of 2013, along with uh, three honorable mentions. Honorable mention, Fire Emblem. I enjoyed my stay with Fire Emblem, and disappointed I did not get to spend more time with it. Uh, this is my first experience with the Fire Emblem game, and found to be a fine variation of the strategy RPG genre, despite the series' notorious reputation for being incredibly difficult and the harsh punishments for failure. While the translation and story were both excellent, ultimately I felt the game became too complex for its own good. While there's excellent, challenging strategy RPG gameplay to be found within Fire Emblem Awakening, the relationship system felt awkward and poorly explained. At the end, it felt less like its own game than some weird hybrid of Shining Force and Persona's relationship building and Fantasy Star 3's generation-spanning storyline. Honorable Mention Grand Theft Auto V You know that one friend you have who's still wearing South Park t-shirts? Same guy who's fun to hang around with, but has been making the same jokes since 2001. Keeps pretending to be ironically racist, but you think might actually be really racist. Grand Theft Auto V is kind of like that guy, but it's also fabulously wealthy and you can't get rid of him. Is Grand Theft Auto V a fun game? Sure, it's the best Grand Theft Auto game that Rockstar has ever made. Is the story good? Sure, but it's a Rockstar game, so you sort of expect that by, that by this point. Are the characters good? Sure, but you get the feeling Rockstar really wanted to make a game about Trevor Phillips the whole time, and included Franklin and Mike simply because 50 straight hours inside Trevor's head would be exhausting. The thing is, nothing's really changed. It's the same gameplay as GTA 3, just with more stuff piled on top of it. And while they learned a lot of lessons from Grand Theft Auto 4, no lessons were taken from Saints Row the Third or Sleeping Dogs, and both of those remain superior examples of the genre. And while Grand Theft Auto V is the best Grand Theft Auto Rockstar ever made, the best Grand Theft Auto ever made is still Sleeping Dogs. The gameplay is still awkward and stilted, the heist mechanic is frustratingly underutilized, and you're punished severely any time you wreak havoc outside the storyline missions. Still, I like this game. I can't complain too much about a game I've sunk three straight weeks into, but it's also the sort of game we should expect more from. Honorable Mention, Far Cry 3 Blood Dragon. I felt Blood Dragon's ridiculous 80s movie premise harmed the game, as it was legitimately a great video game hidden behind layers of neon pink lighting and desert chrome fonts. In fact, the only thing keeping Blood Dragon from appearing higher on the list is there simply wasn't enough of it. You see everything Blood Dragon has to offer in the first two hours of gameplay, but really don't mind because that gameplay is so darn great. But just as I was getting a Blood Dragon's rhythm of liberating garrisons, to open quests, to save scientists, to unlock weapons, to free more garrisons, the game ended. I could have really gone for another 20 hours of Blood Dragon. In a more perfect world, Far Cry 3 Blood Dragon would have been the Far Cry 3 we actually got last year, and instead, uh, the Far Cry 3 we know of would have just been the 3 hour long expansion pack to this, naming a douchebag college kid's wacky island adventures with a madman. Number 10, Rogue Legacy. Rogue Legacy absorbed a week of my life like no other game released this year. It was heroin. And worse, once other people on your friends list notice you're playing Rogue Legacy, they tend to start up Rogue Legacy as well because, oh hey, I should be playing Rogue Legacy. 
In fact, if you own Rogue Legacy, you're probably wondering why you're not playing Rogue Legacy right this minute. Go ahead, I'll be here. Rogue Legacy is simple and limited, but for me that's a large part of the charm. At one level, yes, you're basically wandering around the randomized platforming levels with slightly randomized rule sets every playthrough, but it's a bunch of simple ideas that mesh amazingly well together. Number 9. Gunpoint Gunpoint is that r very rarest of puzzle games. Unique, freeform, and doesn't wear out its welcome. Actually, to the game's detriment, as I could have easily gone for another 5 or 6 hours of Gunpoint's Connect the Dots gameplay and smart espionage. While it's a compact experience, Gunpoint re never repeats its core ideas. Designer Tom Francis said all he intended to say about game design and then walked away, and that's sort of commendable. Most developers would have just been insecure in the vision and forced busy work and padding into Gunpoint to increase the perception of value and harm the game in the process. Still, I'd really like to see Gunpoint 2 at some point. Number 8. Gran Turismo 6 I love everything about Gran Turismo 6. It takes the busy work bullshit and arbitrary roadblocks out of the Gran Turismo formula and wastes no time getting the player into the important work of car worship. My only complaint is while this is the most enjoyable Gran Turismo game I've ever played, it's still a step back from Forza Motorsport 3. There aren't as many events, you don't have nearly the level of customization of your vehicle, and there's no rewind function. That said, it's not as much of a step back from Forza 3 as Forza 5 is, and any fears of a microtransaction economy ruining Gran Turismo 6 are allayed when you realize the Buy Credits button is nestled all the way over to the side of the main menu screen, almost apologetically hidden from view. While Gran Turismo 6 advances the Gran Turismo series, it does nothing to advance the genre as a whole. Forza 3 remains the class of the field, and as such, I cannot put it higher in this list. Number 7. The Stanley Parable I was conflicted about the Stanley Parable, because it essentially does everything Gone Home was trying to do, but only with even fewer game elements. It really does hover on the line of, is this just a movie with a crank attached, or is it actually a video game too much? But it's hard to understand how a story could have been told in any other medium. Enough griping though. Stanley Parable is fantastic. The story, or stories I suppose, are brilliantly told. And every design element and embellishment an act of obvious craft and love. This is the sort of video game people should point to when they demand better storytelling out of video games. It's funny, often brilliant, always dry, and always very, very smart. The Stanley Parable assumes nothing of the player other than you are intelligent and willing to put in a surprising amount of creativity into uncovering all its secrets. Number 6. Legend of Zelda A Link Between Worlds A Link Between Worlds showed us that high-definition re-releases of existing retro classics misses the point entirely. Instead of simply putting a classic game out with new art in an effort to wring more money from a dwindling crowd of nostalgic diehards, a remake should be about updating the soul of a classic game and making it re relevant to an entirely new audience. While A Link Between World is obstinately a sequel to A Link to the Past, in large part it's still the same game. It's the same map, the same weapons, the same enemies, but infused with a modern design think that says arbitrary roadblock should be removed whenever possible. In doing, Nintendo has taken an unqualified classic and made it relevant to an entirely new generation, and perhaps have created a brand new classic in its own right. A Link Between Worlds is going to show up at the top of a lot of lists this year, and I have absolutely no problem with that. My only real complaint is that the entire item rental mechanic is laughably easy to work around, and there's a decided lack of gold sinks in the game. You're a little overpowered by the final fourth of A Link Between Worlds, but maybe empowerment isn't such a bad thing. Number 5. Metal Gear Solid Rising It's no mistake that the best pure action game since Vanquish is brought to us by the same people that made Vanquish. And much like Platinum's 2010 masterpiece, I feel we won't fully appreciate Rising's brilliance until well after it leaves shelves. I felt Rising was unfairly caught between two fan bases with vastly differing needs. It could never be the canonical Metal Gear game Konami fans demanded, and nothing could begin to live up to expectations set by Bayonetta. In the end, Rising is a great game of its own right, albeit uneven in its attempts to satisfy the stealth action elements expected in the Metal Gear Solid game. The fusion of Platinum's over-the-top storytelling and Metal Gear's world is perfectly done, and it's hard to tell where Hideo Kojima's Mandus ends and Platinum's brilliance begins. 4. Brothers, A Tale of Two Sons 
I don't know if you need to be a younger brother to appreciate brother's brilliance, but it certainly helped, and seeing my own relationship with my older brother's reflected helped me fall in love with this game. Not that Brothers isn't an outstanding game in its own right. The control two brothers at once mechanic is obvious and natural, while still allowing for deep, clever puzzle solving. And much like Gunpoint, Brothers never overstays its welcome. You'll breeze through it in an afternoon, but it will feel much shorter than that. And much like Gunpoint, I could have saved this lushly realized world for a good while longer. Artistically, Brothers is probably the best thing anyone will play all year. Fable wishes it could have pulled off a fairy tale aesthetic as well as Brothers has. The story, albeit simple, is told without a single intelligible world spoken between anyone, and yet conveys hope and heartbreak like few before. The world of Brothers is a beautiful place to be in, and I hope Starbreeze can find a way to bring us back to it. Number 3. Gone Home The question about Gone Home's worth as a video game is pointless in these discussions. After all, if we're really concerned about what was the best pure game, then anyone making a list would just hand it to Metal Gear Solid Rising in unison and be done with it. But it happens a lot of times. Our favorite games are terrible at the singular task of being a competently plain video game. Take Resident Evil, for instance. Up until Resident Evil 4, these games were terrible games. We didn't care. We were there for the atmosphere. Sometimes it felt like an otherwise fantastic game that shoehorned in poorly constructed gameplay elements simply to justify the video game street cred. Last year's Natural Prairie Game of the Year winner, The Walking Dead, was certainly guilty of that. Now what if you had all the storytelling, all the atmosphere, all the characterization, and everything else you loved about The Walking Dead, and simply removed all that awful gameplay? Wouldn't it actually be a more enjoyable game? That's what Gone Home has done. Don't consider a first person movie. Consider all the best parts of the best Walking Dead episode with all the bullshit filler removed. And much like the Stanley Parable, Gone Home could not have been replicated in another medium. Sure, the story could have been boiled down to a TV episode or a short story, but you would not have had the same sense of investment, or exploration, or dread. Gone Home represents the very best of a new genre in a young medium, and our community's cries of hipster game of the year only serve to discourage creative people like Steve Gaynor for doing more daring creative work. Gone Home might not be my personal game of the year, but it absolutely deserves consideration. It is without a doubt the most important game anyone will play all year. Number 2. Bioshock Infinite Look, I get it. The gameplay is archaic and anachronistic. There are troubling hints of classism to the story. The entire second act either needs to be re- major reworking or should have been left out entirely. I don't care. Infatuation is inherently irrational. I can't justify it. Best I can tell you is that I'm a sucker for redemption stories, and Bioshock Infinite is a finer absolution story as you'll ever get inside of a video game. The multiverse spanning storyline and hard bitten private dick protagonists don't hurt. Hell, there's no element about Bioshock Infinite's storyline that didn't fall in love with in some way. Which brings us to the gameplay. I'm not the best person to reference on this subject, as I actually enjoy Bioshock's core gameplay mechanics, but I can see why people are disappointed. Bioshock didn't break any boundaries in 2007, and it feels downright archaic in 2013. The levels are too wide open to give and give little indication of where you're being attacked from, and the handymen are a poor replacement for the iconic Big Daddy. But like I said with Gone Home, if we were voting for it to cross strict gameplay lines, I'd have stopped at number 5. The story, the characters, and the setting spoke to me in the way that few games ever have. And to be honest with you, the moment I saw Elizabeth quarreling and la- laughing and dancing to a quickerized version of Girls Just Want to Have Fun, I knew I wasn't going to be talked out of love in this game. Bioshock Infinite wasn't the most important game I played this year, but it was my favorite. But the best, well... Number 1. The Last of Us The Last of Us wins simply because it brings everything together. The story is outstanding, if not quite as good as Bioshock Infinite's. The gameplay is fantastic, if not on the same level as Metal Gear Solid Rising, and it nearly approaches Gone Home's level of emotional investment. A lot of parallels have been drawn between The Last of Us and Bioshock Infinite, but I believe this does a disservice to The Last of Us simply because it gets more of its setting. Whereas Infinite is set in a city in the clouds across the endless multitudes of possible realities, The Last of Us manages to eke out emotional response for the thin creative gruel of yet another goddamn zombie apocalypse. The Last of Us doesn't do anything new with this setting, the cordyceps infected or Romero zombies with a fresh coat of paint, and once again man is a real monster. But the characterizations and tensions it creates in this well-worn setting are top-notch. 
A lot of games developers talk about investing player emotionally as characters, usually via cheap tricks like dog companions. But The Last of Us delivers using nothing more than the base interaction between Joel and Ellie, their dialogue with one another, the casual ways they interact, their growing friendship as the green grows on. It is one of the very few games that actually gets character development right, and does so without pounding you in the head with obvious symbolism. The Last of Us is smartly written, and that does not assume that players will feel betrayed if it turns out the end goal was 180 degrees from where you set out from the start. All of that would be lost if The Last of Us did not deliver in the gameplay department. The Last of Us represents an interesting fusion of third-person cover-based mechanics, stealth, and survival horror. Like a good survival horror game, your resources are inherently limited. Like a good stealth game, you are encouraged to creep around most encounters when possible and the creeping feels like a valid game mechanic and not simple manipulation of enemy vision cones. And like a good third-person shooter, you feel empowered when it's your time to finally pull out your shotgun and blow some redneck survivalist into next week. Yet The Last of Us manages to balance all three of these elements. You can hold your own in a firefight, but firefights are best avoided whenever possible because engaging the enemy uses so many of your precious resources, so you're better sneaking around and wailing your enemies from the shadows whenever possible. But perhaps more than anything else, The Last of Us had my favorite moments of the year. Discovering a herd of wild giraffes escaped from the Salt Lake City zoos. Ellie's desperate struggle to care for a wounded and dying Joel. Joel and Ellie's horseback journey through the ruins of Eastern the University of Eastern Colorado. Joel's final conversation with Ellie and the heart-wrenching revelation it brings. In the beginning, if the opening 10 minutes of The Last of Us isn't the best introduction to any video game ever, it's certainly top 3, and I don't know what the two games ahead of it really are. While The Last of Us was my game of the year, I could just as easily be talked into any of a half dozen other games, some of them not even appearing this list because I never got a chance to play them. The important thing is that this is a year where there are no invalid game of the year nominees. If you don't see your favorite game at the top of our list at Nitro Beard, that's fine. It doesn't mean it's a bad game or your opinion is invalid, but there's no way anyone had enough time to play all the worthwhile games as much as they deserve this year. Just hope that next year is even half as good as 2013. <laughs>